Welcome back, everybody. Now, obviously, businesses have a key role to play in leading the charge on the climate crisis and delivering on their pledges. But actions speak louder than words. So here now to share their experience and expertise on their road to net zero, I'm joined by Kelly Becker from Schneider Electric and Harry Bocott from McKinsey. And welcome to you both. Uh, so we've got uh, 40 minutes or so to talk through what I think are real corporate strategies, real decisions, the things that make this tough, the things that make this rewarding. Uh, and then maybe we'll finish a little bit about how you think the UK is doing, because both of you, of course, have uh, belonged to multinational companies. Uh, Kelly, I'd like to start with you. So just warm us up a little bit. Tell us the Schneider story. Tell us the journey you are all on on this road to net zero. Well, good morning, Tony. Thanks for having me. Um, I think for those who don't know Schneider Electric, we are an energy and automation company. So our roots are really in manufacturing and then have been evolving over the course of the last 20 years around digital and into far more tech, software services. Um, you know, the company's goals um, really are around serving our customers globally, 150,000 employees. We have about 4,000 between the UK and Ireland, which is what I have responsibility for. Um, and, and you never know our products, right? They're sort of behind the walls, if you will, but we run some of the largest data centers in the world, hospitals, every type of building you could imagine we operate in. And the company has really been on a journey since about 2005 to make sure that we're working with our customers as well as in our own facilities towards net zero, driving energy efficiency, um, and ensuring that we're all using our resources to the to sort of best capacity that we can in, in the planet. Kelly, can you, can you make it uh, really practical? Give me an example of some of the sort of transformations you're either asking of customers or that you're needing to make at the back end to make this a reality? Well, Tony, so we believe that if we can't do it ourselves within our own buildings, then how do we actually advise our customers to that? And so what you see in our own facilities over the last um, 15 years or so is things as simple as temperature control, right? We make building management systems. And so that's sort of um, the easiest end of what we're doing. We've really worked hard on our supply chains. So recyclable materials, limiting the amount of, you know, uh, travel around the world, if you will. So more localized supply chains over the last many years, um, all the way to things like installing microgrids at our facilities, and more recently pledging as a company, as well as in the UK and Ireland, to move our entire fleet to electric vehicles. And does this, I mean, I want to come back to quite a lot of that, certainly the supply hmm. chain point, but does this all add up to a sort of set of key milestones? I mean, you know, 2050 is a long way away. Uh, so how do you think about your own journey? Have you got a sort of ticking clock or have you got a set of KPIs that you're constantly measuring the sort of the long term, but you're measuring it every month or every quarter? We are, we are, so we're very closely aligned with the UN sustainability goals in terms of our own corporate social responsibility goals um, and have been for the past 15 plus years, if you will. And that really relates from um, sort of six key goals around climate efficiency and resources, our people, um, and more uh, recently, which I'm especially interested in, work within the communities in which we operate. So we've locally set a number of goals, both for the UK as well as in Ireland, about what do we want to do within the communities that we work alongside people. So um, well published, if you will, and changes every number of years evolve. Um, and I think one of the more important things is that all of our employees have a portion of their pay, which is tied to the company's sustainability goals and actually delivering on those goals. So it makes it very real for all of our people. Okay, you just, you just really pricked up my interest at the end there with that. Tell me a little <laughs> bit more about that. So people's pay is dependent on your sustainability goals. Can you give me a bit more on that? Yeah, so a portion of all of our pay structures, and it, it varies, obviously, dependent on where you are, but... Mine, for an example, is very closely tied to our sustainability commitments in the UK and Ireland. How are we managing within our own facilities? Are we reducing waste, uh, both within our factories as well as our, you know, almost 50 locations um, in the UK and Ireland? 
and and what are we doing to drive those goals? Um, and then it, it varies based on uh, each employee, but it's a it's a really material piece of of how we're judged on performance. Yeah, it really is. It's incredibly impressive. Now the whole story sounds impressive, uh, Kelly. The the risk is it sounds easy, uh, mm. but of course it's not easy. So are are you willing to confess the hardest bits? Tell us what's really hard about doing this. Yeah, I think the hardest bits are the balance between, you know, profitability of a for-profit company and doing the right thing for the environment and for our customers. Um, and and one of the things with, you know, moving towards this community-oriented goal with our employees is making it real for people. And that, you know, the best ideas we get every day are from our employees, actually, both for what we are doing within um, our own facilities, but what we're doing more broadly with our customers as well. And so, you know, there's hard choices. And I think that's a huge piece of this conversation um, for all companies, which is, you know, what are you willing to do to, to make right, if you will, by the planet and future generations? And what are the trade-offs you're willing to make? And, and it's, it's hard sometimes. And just, uh, you're, you're already getting us into the, some of the topics I wanted to come on to. So just before I come to Harry, one more question I think on that one, which is, I understand that trade-off question, but uh, if you'll forgive my crudity, is there real money in this? So is this a trade-off between doing the right thing versus doing the profitable thing? Or where do you see genuine value creation in either revenue, shareholder recognition from this journey? Well, you know, I think we've all seen since the beginning of the pandemic a renewed focus on the environment and being green, if you will. Um, you know, we also are very strong believers, quite frankly, in diversity and inclusion as part of our core mission. And all of these things work together. And what you are seeing is shareholders far more interested now in whether you have a diverse uh, leadership team, you have diverse employees, you have goals associated with that, as well as your sustainability commitments. Um, I think there is a real business imperative here for companies moving forward that you can do it all. Um, and it won't be an overnight journey. If you haven't started, you have to start small and you have to um, evaluate for yourself what are the areas you can make changes, but you have to have a plan. And I think that has become very clear, um, certainly with our shareholders and many of our other companies that um, we would compare ourselves to. Yeah, that's super. Kelly, thanks so much. Harry, I'm going to turn to you. And of course, McKinsey have got clients from every sector in every part of the world. So you, I hope, have a sort of overview uh, of the entire universe and who's doing this well and badly. But tell me a little bit about what you think marks out the leaders. So whatever sector they're in or whatever country they're in, what is the sort of secret sauce of what the leading companies are doing on this agenda? Well, good morning. I think uh, many of them were touched on by, by Kelly and her remarks a moment ago. I, I think I would see four main things. Um, the first is that they're embedding sustainability as a core business question. So not as a side project, not as a CSR effort, and as a core business problem. Exactly as Kelly describes it, it tackles not only the product and the portfolio, but people and culture, systems and processes, the metrics that you use to incentivize performance, and of course the narrative that you use internally and externally to galvanize performance. So a core business problem. And Harry, just before you go on to the other ones, have you ever heard of people linking it to pay before? Uh, only very rarely. I have uh, a little bit, but, um, but I love what Kelly's saying. I think it's terrific. I think if you're really going to make change stick, and if you're really going to get people working in a new way, particularly across some of those functional or business unit boundaries that need to be broken down when you're working on an integrated plan, then, then what Kelly describes is exactly right. Great. Go on to your other points. Gosh, um, well, I think the second one, uh, Kelly, might be, a, might be a mindset. I think we, when we see companies really making big strides forward, it's because they've got a mindset around speed and a bias to action where the perfect isn't the enemy of the good. It is more important to take the first step and get moving than it is to have perfectly articulated every step they're going to take over the next 15 or 20 years to, to net zero. Um, the third thing I'd say is, and, and it's what my American colleagues would probably call a, a strategy that balances offense and defense, by which I mean there are uh, levers in the journey that capture 
the growth and the potential and the value creation, Tony, that you touched on a moment ago, whilst also recognizing that there's a bunch of things that need to be done to build resilience. Uh, and a really good plan has both of those two things in it. Uh, and then the fourth thing I'd say is that companies that are doing this really well recognize that there's a, often a chicken and egg problem uh, in catalyzing the technological innovation that's going to be required to get us all the way down the journey. And so they're striking innovative partnerships, creating ecosystems that, if you like, can lock in the demand signal to enable the technology to develop that allows it to get to sale more, more quickly. You know, um, logistics, shipping, and ammonia fuel, for example, would be you know a way of thinking about creating interdependent ecosystems that can help unlock new innovation. Well, it's interesting how you talk about that chicken and egg, because, of course, you have that in the relationship between business and government, where it's almost like everyone's waiting yeah. for the other to move. So what do you do if you're a leader of a company and you're feeling this chicken and egg thing and you're thinking, well, actually, I, I don't want to make an investment here when I'm not sure the market is developed enough or that looks too expensive. At the same time, it's never going to be developed enough or cheaper unless all of us embark on it. It's like a collective problem. So what's your advice to a leader of a company who's thinking, how does this thing get started? Well, I, I, I think you, you know, with the chicken and egg, you could go round and round wherever. That's the, that's the point it's trying to make. Um, I think if you're the leader of a company, you have to understand that in the greatest reallocation of capital in history, which is what this journey to a net zero economy is, there are going to be winners and losers. Um, the cost of the transition is not going to be spread evenly. And so you do need to jump in. Now, and of course, it is tough. I mean, Tony, you, you, you make the right, the right reference. You know, this feels like something which is costly, risky, where the, the benefits that come from it can be perceived as um, humanitarian rather than shareholder, distant rather than linked to my, my quarterly earnings cycle. Um, but there is, I think, a need to jump in um, because those that choose to get out ahead of this are going to be able to create a lasting competitive advantage. So, you know, what do you do to do that? I think a crash course in climate economics for your top team is a, is a first step. I think really understanding your, your fact base, you know, what is it that matters in the sustainability agenda for us um, and how are we performing today? Um, what kind of contribution do we want to make in the future? So, you know, where are we really going to win versus just play? Um, and then, and I think Kelly touched on this as well, what is the sequenced set of actions where you understand both the carbon and financial impact of everything there? So that you can sequence them in a way that matches um, your financial obligations, the capacity and capability you have in your organization, whilst also getting you out ahead of your competition. Um, and really, this needs to be treated like any other business transformation, which is to say it's quite a difficult thing to do. It requires execution muscle. And again, exactly as Kelly was saying, you've got to think about the cultural um, and human incentives that underpin all of that change behavior. And in your experience, Harry, just to finish with you, in your experience, so we've talked about what the leaders are doing. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm assuming that this isn't just a case of leaders and laggards. Actually, there's a lot of people, most of business is somewhere in between, which is that they're incredibly willing to go on the yeah. journey, uh, but there are some big barriers or some things that they're finding insurmountable. What for you are sort of the biggest barriers that the pack are facing in, in sort of making the moves you describe? I think the, um, as you say, the uh, awareness of the, the trend is very clear, but the understanding of the implications are less clear. So this notion that there will be winners and losers, this notion that the costs of the transition are going to polarize the basis of competition in every industry sector isn't well understood, which means that often um, there is internal inertia and an internal understanding about the, uh, the cost benefit trade-off that's required to get this journey. I think the second big barrier is that shifting a portfolio into uh, sectors or product propositions that are growing faster, um, investing sufficiently in the right technology to allow you to um, accelerate is, these are, you know, these are big shifts and these are classic corporate strategy challenges where the debate comes not only with the, uh, the unknown future or the ambiguity of the future, but also a bunch of 
inertia, particularly in successful companies. So the ones that I think are suffering from these issues the most, Tony, are the ones who are doing fine right now. Oh, I see. Because the, the motivation to change is, is hardest to grapple yeah, yeah. with. That's a very interesting way of looking at it. Uh, Kelly, can I come back to some of the... There are a couple of big challenges that I think are really interesting about what you described at the beginning. Some of them are you know, big and global, and the others are you know, domestic and supply chain based. So just starting with the global, is it possible, given the complete disparity of where countries are on this journey, to have a global strategy? Or do you find that actually you've got some markets that are incredibly aggressive and progressive and other markets that aren't? How do you manage that consistently? Well, I think, Tony, you know, on the back of the G7 this weekend, obviously, if the G7 countries are the only places in the world that work on net zero and drive towards um, sustainability, we will have a global problem. And so I think it doesn't help if uh, we make changes here in the UK and Ireland, but in other parts of the world that might be described as developing still, you know, they're heating with coal. Um, that, that doesn't ultimately work. The equation doesn't work. And so, you know, as a company, um, our aspirations for our clients in the UK are very similar to what they might be in parts of Asia or South America. It's to drive energy efficiency into their facilities and use less. Ultimately, that is the goal of what we are trying to do. And so um, how you accomplish that, I think to what Harry was talking about a little bit might differ by geography and region. And obviously governments have very different uh, plans. They have different energy sources, which makes a huge difference as you're looking at um, your path to net zero. But just simply moving around in terms of liability uh, around this problem doesn't work. And so we are approaching this you know, as a global, uh, plan. The conversations I have with my colleagues in uh, the developing world are the same as I'm having here. It's more of the how do you get there is what we're seeing and, and the pace potentially of change. Because uh, that's interesting. I think I, as, sorry, finish up. No, because I think as Harry mentioned, um, it, it can be a costly proposition dependent on what you were trying to do. And so we talk to clients about um, you know, somebody who's been on this journey like us as a corporation for 15 plus years is not at the same place as somebody who's trying to figure out where do they start now. And there's really materially different things you can do. And that's really our message to a lot of our clients is that if you're just starting on your path, then let us help you on those things that can make a more immediate um, difference. You don't generally start with building a microgrid on your facility yeah. site. That, that probably isn't your starting point. And are there 150 different market strategies for the 150 odd different markets you might be in? Or actually, is this coming now down to a pretty sort of typical taxonomy or journey and people, countries are in about one of three different places? Does it feel like every country is radically different or actually the pattern recognition now says that there are, you know, we're at two or three stages of evolution? I think your strategy is probably a bit different underpinned by the same core principles. So in the area I have responsibility for, we have very large data center customers. And so there's a lot of conversation around the impact on the environment around data centers. Well, we wouldn't be on this Zoom call right now if it wasn't for a data center hosting this, right? If you're in other parts of the world and a big piece of your market is around oil and gas, then you're having a really different conversation which says the future as we see it is far more electrical. Well, what does that mean in terms of long, long-term sort of goals and sustainability? So, um, the the aspirations I think are the same at the end. The how you get there and what the market dynamics look look like are, are quite different. At the end of the day, um, you know, Perry's clients are for the most part for-profit businesses in the same way we are, and so there is a balance between how do you um, effectively kind of go on this race to net zero, if you will, as a business, um, and at the same time, live up to your shareholder expectations. And I think there's really interesting things happening in the market when you look at some of the largest oil and gas players in the world, as an example, and what they are trying to do strategically um, and, and how they're you know, looking at their markets and evolving based on what their consumers and, and clients are looking for. 
Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And, and you're seeing that and we'll hear from some of them over the next couple of days. Tell me a little bit about supply chain, uh, making this real in the supply chain, which feels complicated for two reasons. One, because it's outside of your complete control. Hmm. But secondly, because there'll be more SMEs in the supply chain. And I think whilst it's fair to say that it's probably too crude to say that big companies find this more straightforward than smaller companies, certainly SMEs on the face of it lack the same access to resources and capital uh, and people that large companies will have. So how is it playing out in the supply chain? Is it really very hard or actually are you finding it easy to bring people along on the journey and are you supporting them on their journey? Well, I think as a large corporation, to your point, we have many experts and, and people who this is their business every day is to ensure we drive a sustainable supply chain. However, I think supply chains have really evolved in the last 10 plus years. So as an SME, it would not be surprising for you to say to a supplier, I want all recyclable packaging. Right. That, that is not a surprising thing these days. This has been part of this is one of the earlier um, sort of things brought into supply chains. And so I think for, you know, for us as a company, but also just in terms of um, advice for SMEs, it's, I think it comes down to what do you stand for as a business? What is your mission? What is important to you? What do you believe in? And if this is a, an important piece of your credo and, and what you're trying to accomplish, then um, start small and figure out the things that have been done before. Conferences like this are a great place to ask other people, what do they do? Where did they start? Um, and how do you make a plan that is attainable? Because I think as Harry said, deciding you're gonna boil the ocean, if you will, from the beginning, um, doesn't make sense for a lot of people. Start with something that you can accomplish and go from there would be my advice. Harry, thinking about Kelly's point about you know, actually a lot of companies in supply chains have been making adjustments for a long time. Is there something about the pace of change that's making the curve steeper? Or actually, can, can we break this down into manageable chunks? And if I'm a, a, a smaller or medium sized business, or I'm a large business, but I'm just behind, uh, is the mountain climb steeper? Or actually, can I break this down into highly believable chunks that are fundable, deliverable uh, with my current talent uh, uh, and, uh, and approach? I think both have to be true, Tony. So I, I don't think you can look at the mountain and not say that uh, the rate of change is accelerating and the uh, transparency and disclosure obligations that we've seen in the financial sector recently are going to move across into the real economy that was discussed over the weekend at the G7. So I think the, you know, the mountain is getting steeper. Um, but, you know, for those companies that then freeze and think, goodness, I, I don't know how I'm going to grapple with all of this. I need to think about it before I do anything. They're the ones that are going to get left behind. Um, and as the cost curves steepen and polarize, you know, they're the ones who may find their business model under threat. So I think both are true. And it means that you have to start thinking about how you can move forward in um, manageable trends. I wish I was a mountain climber because I could then follow this analogy through for the rest of the session. But I'm not. But I'm sure mountaineers will tell me that it's the next step that's the most important one. And is there I, I'm, I'm really interested for those people at the lower part of the mountain. Uh, is there money in this? I'm going to ask the question again. And, and I think the reason why I ask it is because it may well be that uh, there's money in the long run, right? There's a pot at the end of the rainbow for those that make the, go on the kind of journey that Schneider have gone on. But if I need to fund this investment as I go, are there real ways to make returns? Do, do, do investments, do a incremental approach to getting better at this, does it pay off and how? Uh, yes, there's money in this. Um, not everyone's going to get it. So if we think about a, a decomposition of growth for, for any company, you know, about three quarters uh, of a company's growth comes from the momentum of the portfolio that it's sitting in, you know, rather than its performance within those sectors. Um, and that's why there's value to get from uh, the transition to a net zero economy, because it's going to create faster growing uh, sectors of our economy, whether that's a, a product proposition or a new sector or a new technology. So there's value to be had here, the same way that there's value to be had from 
capital reallocation and portfolio realignment in any corporate strategy process. And, and, and what we touch on about the short versus long term is one of the enduring challenges in balance of corporate strategy in the right way. Um, I think, by the way, that and we were touching on resilience earlier in the day's proceedings. Yeah. Um, the question of resilience um, creates new opportunities for growth in exactly the same way that the race to zero does too. And so I think the question for any company is how can we better align our portfolio with those fast growing sectors? How can we then tell that story externally in a credible way? Because the credibility of that story will affect the, uh, the price of our borrowing. Um, and, and so I think it that's, becomes a circular piece. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting way to think about it. As you say, any, any, when, whenever there's any kind of change, there's new businesses cannibalizing old businesses. There's new parts of your business competing for resources versus the existing, perhaps cash generative part of your business. And that, as you say, climate in, in one sense is just like everything else that's come before. Uh, I mean, obviously not planetary wise, but it is in a corporate strategy sense. That makes it more accessible, I think. And, and if I may, before I move us on, I'm interested in McKinsey. So McKinsey is a professional services consulting firm. Uh, I'm not sure I know what your carbon footprint is, but uh, it's very easy to understand this kind of journey Schneider uh, need to go on. Tell us about your journey as a sort of global professional services firm. Is this take less flights? Is that is that the strategy or, or what else? Is there something in your portfolio that's changing? Yeah, well, that's a big part of it, Tony. So, um, so we've been carbon neutral since uh, 2018. Um, and we did that in sort of three main ways. Um, firstly, looking at our, our real estate portfolio and, and consuming less. So, for example, our new office in, um, in Bloomsbury um, you know, has more plants in it than it does light bulbs. Um, we switched to 100% renewable electricity. Um, and then we've been offsetting our, our emissions. Now, more recently, though, we've taken a further step uh, and we've um, you know, taken a science-based target approach to being climate neutral by, by 2030, aligned around a one and a half degree portfolio. Um, you know, and to get there, we are going to have to address the number of flights that people take. And of course, you know, we, the renewed way of working as we hopefully put the pandemic behind us, I think is going to be a massive catalyst for organizations, including ours, to think about purposeful presence you know do you really need to be somewhere physically or is this medium going to be satisfactory we've laid out a target of reducing um per person uh, emissions by 30 percent um and then we're going to be investing in nature-based solutions to extract carbon from the atmosphere to cover the rest so um i noticed the secretary of state was talking a lot about uh, reforestation so you know we're putting uh, a lot of investment into that to then offset the remaining emissions that we have so that we can be on that one and a half degree pathway. So that's what that's what we're doing. I do think it's interesting though, if you think about the levers that we're describing here, that a professional services firm you know, isn't that different from any other yeah. organization insofar as we've looked at reducing emissions, we've looked at shifting energy consumption to renewable sources, and now we're looking at you know robust and credible ways of offsetting the rump of emissions that remain. It sounds solid, but I also am now keen to come to your office. I've got a, I've got a vision of the Eden Project as a corporate <laughs> office now. That's what's going through my mind. Let's talk, talking of the Eden Project, let's talk about the UK. Uh, both of you, Harry, I know you've spent quite a long time in Australia. Kelly, I suspect yep. you're from the US, or uh, is, is that right? Yeah. So here you both are now in the UK again. Uh, we're very proud in the UK. We think we're doing well on this stuff. Uh, are we right to feel proud? I mean, obviously, we shouldn't be complacent. Is the UK a great market to do this in? What are, what are, what are our strengths? And, and be honest, what are our weaknesses? Kelly, maybe I'll start with you. You'll, you'll see a few markets around the world. What do we do well? What do we do less well? Yeah, I think, um, you know, we see the UK as one of our key markets in terms of sustainability and where we're driving our business and our ability to grow on a lot of our sectors um, because people do care here around being green and, and what that looks like, and they know it's good business. Um, ultimately, you know, the UK has tremendous infrastructure in the terms of adoption of, of renewables, um, and, and we see that as a really key piece. Um, you know, we love the ambition, Tony. We love the big, clear goals that are stated at press conferences. I think the thing we see is that there's probably the need um, for a bit more detail around regulation 
um, and driving towards uh, these huge goals. So think about the fact that the UK has the oldest stock of kind of pre-1960s buildings in Europe, many of them inefficient. And why would we be allowing planning moving forward where you're not required to figure out a new facility? How do you put solar on the roof? How do you ensure there's a building management system? How do you ensure there's enough electric vehicle chargers or infrastructure in a building? Given the prime minister has stated by 2030, it's going to be an all electric vehicle infrastructure here. So there are really key things we think that need to be done to take um, the aspirations, which are incredible and, and some of the best in the world to reality in the course of the next many years quite quickly. And I think um, that's where we see lots of work that we wanna work alongside the government as well as other corporations, because I'm also a really big believer in sort of this public private partnership approach to these goals. This will not only happen because the government says it will happen, it will happen as well because people like Harry will influence their clients that this is a smart financial move. We will have conversations with those clients that say, let us show you how to you know, make your buildings and, and all of your infrastructure far more efficient and consumers. So each of us individually will also then say, this is actually important to me that my home uses as little of all of these different sources as possible. Yeah, that's right. I mean, one of the interesting things to me, uh, and I'm going to jump to a well-known CBI campaign, is that uh, not only are we not making those investments in our buildings, but actually we're disincentivized to do so by business rates. Business rates actually punish you if you increase the value of your property because you make uh, net zero adjustments. Uh, which is crazy, and we should stop that. I'm sorry, that was just a little CBI <laughs> plug there, uh, if the Chancellor is watching us. But I, I do want to come back, uh, Kelly, on this point, because in, in my discussions, you know, I'll speak on the one hand to folks like you, and then on the other hand, I'll speak to government. And I think government feel like they've really set out in the 10-point plan, they've really set out in policy direction, commitment to investment, commitment to long-term policy, and yet businesses seem to feel it's good, but it's not enough. And what we need is something more granular. So you mentioned about, you know, uh, building regulation, I guess. Any other examples for you of the kind of stuff that actually, you know, really if government gave us a bit more detail or a bit more commitment, it would genuinely unlock uh, the kind of deployment of capital investment and progression you're describing? Well, I think if, if you want to talk to a voter, right, you're talking to the 27 million plus homeowners in the UK, about what are they doing in their own homes? Um, and how does the government enable and help that? And as you mentioned, you know, a lot of my career was in the US where there are parts of the country like California clearly on track because they have to be because of lack of access and brownouts and things like that. And then there are parts of the country that quite frankly, if we're honest, don't probably think about this all that much because they haven't um, sort of lived through those issues. And I think in the UK, we have the opportunity for the government to help um, people see the way, if you will, right? So if the government comes out and says there's a grant program to do X, how, how do you as both a home developer, but as an individual homeowner, make the most of that? And I think those are the kinds of concrete things. There are many things to be done for businesses. Um, and, and we have to find a balance between, you know, what I care about or what Harry cares about is, executives running a business versus what I might care about as a homeowner and what I want to see done. And they and the government has to work and appeal to both of those entities. Yeah, I think that's right. It's the making it real so that people instantly see both on the demand side and the supply side, there's a market here, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Harry, you've, uh, you've lived and worked in different parts of the world, uh, now recently back in the UK from whence you started. Uh, are, we think we're really good. Are we good in the UK uh, or what are we good at and what do we need to be better at? We're pretty good. We're pretty good. And I, I, I like the boldness of the, the targets that have been laid out. I think, you know, a transformation always starts with a bold aspiration. I think we have some structural advantages too. So our tech sector, I think the financial services sector, you know, as a allocator of capital, um, could really be a catalyst for the changes in the, you know, the real economy um, that we need to see. I also think it's important to recognise that the UK is less exposed to climate hazard than many places. So we have a number of 
inbuilt structural advantages. Um, I think the things that Kelly was describing around, you know, greater clarity um, in the way that government and the private sector work together will be very helpful. But really, I would, I would put the monkey on the private sector's back now and say um, there are some structural advantages. There is a bold target. Um, but this is a race where you and your shareholders could win or could lose. And so it's, it's up to them to work out now how to play that hand. Can I push you uh, on that? So, uh, I mean, we, like you, believe that the private sector now has got huge strides to make. One of the arguments, particularly thinking about the G7 and the race to COP, is that actually we, you, any company might be constrained here by, by small scale compared to some of the bigger markets uh, around the UK. So, for example, a big debate about gigafactories uh, and whether or not we could make enough battery production in the UK to power, uh, to power a real success story on these shores versus what else is happening in China or continental Europe. Uh, so uh, help me understand, Harry, if you would, whether or not actually, no, businesses based in the UK, this is going to be a big enough market, there's going to be big enough government investment for us to genuinely feel that we can lead the world in some of these technologies where surely scale, and the Chinese and the Americans in particular, are surely destined to dominate. Yes, I think you know, one, can, you know, one can look at other places where um, the scale can make a massive difference. But I think um, you know, thoughtful companies that can really understand um, these granular segments that are going to grow and perhaps the ones that are going to really enable a bunch of the other changes that need to happen can absolutely be a source of, of success. And I think the company that is wondering whether to move because it is wondering whether you know, China might do X or the US might do Y, you know, might be the one that you know, watches the opportunity my past. So I would, I would be saying to, to every organization now, really understand where exactly it is that you want to win um, versus where you just want to play um, and build a detailed plan to get there. I yeah, think, I think um, that's, yeah, I think I, that's... To be honest, I'm, I'm much more about organizations now seizing, seizing the day. Yeah, seizing the moment, as we call it, Harry. But I tell you something, it, it does reinforce the point we make, I think, in our strategy, Seize the Moment, which is the investments you make in a country like the UK, where we are pretty close to the frontier, they actually lead to export opportunities. And I think that idea of winning at something and being globally in demand is right. And Kelly, it was interesting what you said earlier about actually the UK being a key market in this agenda for Schneider. So what, if you don't mind me asking you, don't reveal any corporate secrets, but when you think of the key markets around the world where actually uh, the climate dimension of the business can really be tested and extended, UK is one, what, what are the others? Um, I think the US is very clearly a key market, um, has been on this path for quite some time. We're obviously excited that the US has rejoined the Paris Climate Accords, um, a really critical piece of, um, you know, government decisions, if you will. I think there are places like Australia, which Harry knows quite better than I do, that have big environmental agendas um, and can really be a key part of driving this forward. And then I think there are other parts of the world where, back to where we started, Tony, which was, you know, there are parts of the world that are behind and should the G7 and others uh, move forward, but then other parts of the world don't catch up or don't engage, um, we will have real problems. And, and Schneider obviously is operating, um, yeah. you know, in 100 plus countries around the world. And so we're experiencing this every day. But it goes back to, you know, what I said from the beginning, which is around this core mission. What do you believe in? What are you trying to accomplish as a company? And just starting. Yeah. So at Davos this year, Schneider was named the most um, sustainable company in the world. But that's because we've been on a 15 plus year journey towards that. It didn't happen overnight. And I think that's really the conversation for businesses um, in the UK and beyond is to say, just start, yeah, pick yeah, something good. to start with. Good, that's, that's what you do with every chicken and egg situation. Uh, right, just a couple of minutes <laughs> yeah. left. I, I want a question about COP and then I want a question, uh, I want to get your advice for every firm. So uh, let's start with COP. Uh, 
Harry, uh, I'm, I'm about to start the speculation on COP. I'm starting it right here today. Uh, are you hopeful? What needs to happen? What are the chances of success? Uh, I'm hopeful. Um, I think what needs to happen is um, just some real clarity of direction um, globally, as Kelly says, so that the private sector can mobilize around it. Um, I think we need to see an acceleration of the transparency and disclosure from the financial sector out into the real economy. Um, and I think we need to have much greater um, emphasis on resilience. Yeah. Um, you know, there are going to be more than 3 billion people exposed to severe climate hazard by 2050. So we yeah. really do need to do something about that. And the reason I'm hopeful is because I've seen each of those three themes, you know, in some of the readout from the G7 over the weekend and, and so on and so forth. So that, that gives me some cause for cause for hope. Uh, Kelly, are you also hopeful and what needs to happen? Um, I'm super hopeful. And I think back to your, one of your questions, this is the chance for the UK to lead, right? Um, I think the other key thing is the technology is here. The technology enables where we are trying to go. Now it's about the will, if you will, um, and how much people want to believe that this is a real problem that we have to solve as a global community and how willing they are to play their part. Um, but I'm very hopeful. I think uh, in the last 16, 17 months, we've seen far more conversation on this um, than, than we ever have prior to that. And that, for me, um, is really empowering and exciting for us. Kelly, I think that's right. I, I sometimes say to businesses, I don't know when it happened, but at some point over the last two years, we've crossed a chasm here. More and more mm -hmm. companies, more and more CBI members that I speak to are just describing this as core strategy now rather than, you know, risk management or reputation management. And that, you know, I think almost the pandemic masked that development. But, and I still can't pinpoint how and where it happened. Like, I guess you can't most movements, but I think we're definitely at that stage. So look, final question, Harry, I'll come to you first. Uh, what should businesses listening, uh, what should they do in the next five months? I mean, you know, just well, so, so give us an agenda till the end of the year. There's a lot of things on. Uh, we've got reopening or not coming up this evening. Uh, there's COP at the end. Do I move? Do I move faster? Do I wait? What do I do? Well, you've, you've stolen my thunder because I was going to say treat it as a core business strategy question. Um, so if that's, the, if that's the high level answer, the more tactical thing I think would be to say, sit down with your top team and get a briefing on climate economics. So you can really work out how the climate agenda affects your financial agenda. And are you offering discounted economics tutoring <laughs> for uh, anybody uh, for 10 sessions? The exceptionally for, good value. Yeah, 10 sessions for £400. <laughs> uh, Kelly, uh, what, what's Schneider going to be doing in the next five months? What do you think are going to be the priorities for you? Um, we are going to be very clearly digging into a lot of our community initiatives in the UK and Ireland and getting our employees more deeply embedded in our goals here um, and working within our communities um, to drive forward. And, and as always, working with our clients as this becomes a bigger and bigger topic about what they need to do to drive change. What does that look like? Um, how do they afford it to some of the earlier conversations? Um, and how do they make it real for both um, their operations as well as their employees? Well, look, making it real is really the theme of these two days. And I want to thank you both and McKinsey and Schneider and our other sponsors for your support, because I think the making it real, or as I said, from ambition to action, I think, you know, there could be no better time than the day after the G7 on the road mm -hmm. to COP that business makes that shift. Uh, and the two of you have been just brilliant panelists uh, for helping us work out how to do that. Uh, so coming up at 11 o'clock, uh, we'll be talking employment and environment by asking, can the UK be a hub for low carbon industry?